really just before I get up here. Thanks. I think it's important to kind of point this out. I'm going to talk about uh, many ways what we learned as we went through uh, trying to think about how to communicate things at the Science Table here in Ontario. But whatever I show that's content is really the result of at times more than 100 scientists from across the province working in a volunteer fashion. Uh, and that I think in itself is kind of one of the nice success stories that uh, people in our, uh, our field came forward. Uh, everything from economics to anthropology to epidemiology to infectious disease to psychology, uh, any number of clinical specialists came forward and volunteered their time. Um, the other thing I'll say, uh, you know, uh, to be honest, is that some of the thoughts here that I'm going to share are really the result of my discussions with Carolyn Tui, who a number of you may remember, uh, is a really thoughtful scholar of political science, has helped us think about kind of the, the institutional uh, perspective on all of this. Okay, are we good to go? Not quite. Okay. Slides aren't showing up, so. Great. I'll wait till we get the slides up. Great. We're fine. Great. And uh, just before I get on to the first slide, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. I see uh, some old friends in the audience. I see some old friends on the Zoom screen. So it's really nice to, uh, nice to be here with you. Okay. So the whole idea of providing scientific advice to policymakers is not a new one. And if you think back in a number of other countries, it's actually a long-standing function, a long-standing function with a whole bunch of structures and what we say in sociology sort of institutions around it, right? So if you look south of the border, despite some of our uh, concerns about the uh, current state of the uh, Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, the CDC is a long-standing uh, institution. It comes out of essentially a quasi-military sort of background from the U.S. Public Health Service, which itself comes out of a purely military background, and it's been around since the end of the Second World War. So it has an established function in advice care. If you go across the pond and you go to the United Kingdom, you can find what is the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies, which is a really kind of a standing structure that's called up with a sort of briefing room every time there's an uh, emergency in the United Kingdom, brings experts together from across the United Kingdom to give scientific advice to government on how to cope. And said the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies, where they've got a great acronym to SAGE, uh, was actually a very common uh, feature in the UK's response. Uh, Boris Johnson often saying it's just following science. Uh, and it was an important enough sort of point of focus that there actually was not only a SAGE, but what was called an indie stage, an independent stage, which often said the very same things, but said it in what was seen to be kind of an unbiased way. Uh, and uh, it's a, such an established thing in the UK as well that the chief science advisor in the United Kingdom, they have one, uh, I've had one for an awful long time, actually created guidance in 2010 on how to give scientific advice uh, to government. Uh, and it stresses a lot of the things that you know, Alice and myself and others have tried to push uh, throughout all this. But, Giving scientific advice is not necessarily a simple thing. It seems like it should be easy. Here's the evidence, here's what it looks like, but it's not necessarily a simple thing. My dad always used to distinguish between simple and easy. Uh, sometimes we confuse the two. It, it, simple is, is not necessarily easy. But there's a, an interesting sort of report out of the Institute of Government here uh, that really kind of talks about uh, the early challenges in the United Kingdom. So, you know, they talk about the importance of it, they, put the, uh, they talk about the challenges that uh, advisors uh, face throughout all of this, um, but they also talk about some of the challenges. And there's just a little bit of the text here out in front of it. Um, but I'm gonna kind of hit on a few things here. They talked about the lack of transparency around the effects. Early on in the pandemic, you actually didn't even get to know who was on stage. These are all, almost all of them are university-based scholars. Uh, they're all experts in the field, they're all publishing, but government kept the list of who was on the stage secret as a matter of security uh, and actually, or national security. And actually that kind of filtered through a lot of their stuff. They didn't really release the reports all the time. It was only later that they started to kind of release a meeting summary. And so there's a real challenge around transparency. There's also a challenge around communication. You know, I think maybe we forget kind of the urgency and the pace sometimes that happened at the beginning of the pandemic. For those of you who might have been uh, on your way with uh, kids or grandkids around March break, uh, you remember that our premier said, go away. And then our prime minister said, come back home. And it was a matter of just a couple of days between those two statements. 
So everyone struggles with communication during a situation like this. But you know, as you can see here, in kind of nice sort of uh, way the English have of putting things, muddled communication. Okay, it wasn't clear what we should be doing. We all sometimes we didn't know. Uh, there's also concerns about independence uh, with Sage. At times, the political advisors actually came to the meetings and sat in on the meetings. Uh, and we know that when you've got a you know the prime minister's chief of staff sitting there, that can create kind of a certain amount of pressure on things. And we also know that everyone was interpreting data through a certain lens, right? Some of which was an understandable sort of set of values or perspectives that we take on data. Some of it was a desire not to overinterpret the data, to kind of err on the side of uncertainty and maybe hope for a better outcome. And some of it was just, you know, to be blunt at times, wishful thinking. We've seen all of that throughout all the pandemic. But there was a real challenge in, in dealing with all of this. And it, I think, in some ways, further compromised the science. When in the United Kingdom, the government would stand up and say, we're following the science on what we're doing. Here. And we all know that science is not something nice and encapsulated, sort of says, here's the science, here's the pill, take this. It's got a lot of uncertainty. It's as much a process as it is a result. Uh, but there was a lot of challenges around scientific communication. And we faced a number of those here uh, in Ontario as well. But why do we face those problems? I'm not going to kind of document what I think was good or bad or, or what the uh, you know, what was you know, good communication or bad communication. Let's try to kind of dig down and figure out why this happened. Well, the first issue is that the problems that confront government during a crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic are wicked problems in the truest sense of, the, of this word. Now, look, you know, wicked problems is one of these great terms you can kind of stuff anything into to say it's a challenging situation, but there really aren't always right answers, unequivocally value-free right answers. They're not equations. Uh, and here's a really, I think, uh, interesting one because it pertains heavily to the work that we did at the science table around sick leave. Now, it may seem kind of obvious that if someone's sick with an infectious disease, you don't want them going to work, right? But how do you respond to that? Well, this is an interesting chart from the United States uh, that really talks about the challenges of being someone who is in a risky profession, like a grocery store worker, having to be that front line contact all the time, uh, being someone who has to take the subway or public transit to work, uh, being someone who needs to constantly communicate. And obviously, sometimes there's challenges if you've got a mask on. Uh, the challenge is being someone who probably lives in what we call unsuitable housing. It's not a single bedroom for every person, so you can't isolate. That'd be a multi-generational household. You can see here how different risk factors, when you have an influenza-like illness, start to play out. And you know, if you have sick leave, you actually tend to do less of those risky factors. And not surprisingly, when you don't have sick leave, you tend to do more of it. Because if the choice is, stay home and help prevent the spread of the disease, or go to work, and get a paycheck and put food on the table, that is not an easy choice. It's an easy, I should make it clear, it's an easy choice for someone like me who's a university professor, who even if I showed the greatest incompetence during this period, I'm probably gonna take the same check home at the end of the day. It's really hard for someone who is on a day hourly or daily uh, income who doesn't have that choice. But this isn't the whole story. This seems, you know, to a lot of us sort of immediately clear and, and, and honest. Well, what about longer issues about people not coming to work? What about absenteeism? And when we did our report on sick leave, we immediately had a torrent of argument from economists who said, this is a really bad decision. You're actually going to grind down things even harder. You're going to compound supply chain problems. People won't be able to get food. And they brought evidence forward as well. And so there's not an unequivocal right answer. On this. Nor is there any sort of certainty even. And so, you know, we spent a fair bit of time working with uh, a really sort of like wonderful team of people uh, led by Kumar Murthy initially and then David Earn uh, and Beata Sander throughout all of it uh, on how we get projections of where the disease was going. And this is obviously a very challenging thing to do if you sort of step back, right? Well, we keep on getting new variants, infectiousness keeps on changing. We keep on getting new variants. The idea of how virulent or how much they're going to damage people's health keeps on changing. Um, we know that uh, when people get on TV and say things are bad, that people change their behavior, more masks come on, more people stay at home. We can actually see that in the mobility data when we release these briefs. Mobility would often drop a little bit. So it's really hard to kind of predict the intersection between a virus, behavior, 
and whatever policies get put in place to try to stop this as well. And so we put these charts out. We talk about, um, you know, worst case and best case scenario. We try to draw some generalizations out of that. But if you look at that big gray area underneath all that, that's the range of the estimates put together by our models. We have that five or six teams of any certain of briefing putting those models together. Uh, really good mathematicians, really good epidemiologists, really good economists, and they would come up with a range. And we had to be clear about that. But that creates an incredibly uncertain platform for decision making. And if we kind of take off of all the training that we've had, take that hat off of all our training for a second, imagine. Um, you've made the terrible decision to run for office. Uh, you've been elected. You've made the terrible decision to try to be the premier or the prime minister. And that has also turned out poorly for you. And you're now in that chair making a decision. What do you do with this sort of stuff? How do you make a decision? Particularly if you're not you know, enjoying the benefit of six years of postgraduate training, years as a scholar, years as a community coping with that stuff. So they're really wicked problems that we have to face um, when we try to communicate science. Um, the thing is, is that you're often communicating this to a, um, what we call a generalist public service. Uh, and so I, I show this, uh, that's a picture of uh, David Williams, who's the former chief of medical officer of health. Uh, I like to use this because on the cover of the Toronto Sun that day, uh, my picture actually showed up along with uh, David's and Eileen Davilas, who's the chief medical officer of health on their effort Toronto. And uh, it said, end the dictatorship. Uh, which I thought was nice because my kids saw me on the front page of the paper and they weren't sure what this was. It was nice because I got an extra degree. I'm actually really kind of trained as an epidemiologist. I'm not a clinician. Uh, so I got a little extra sort of credentials on that. But what it means is that you've got an incredibly forceful group of experts who are now communicating with a group of generalists. And what you'll find now increasingly, and it's, it's not my idea, it's uh, Ed Straw's argument uh, when he's talking about the United Kingdom's uh, public service, We've got a generous public service. Two weeks ago, they were leading the Ministry of Transport. Now they're leading the Ministry of Health. Their background might be in policy analysis. It might be in chemistry. It might be, uh, as we had a little while ago, in medicine and epidemiology. And in fact, for a little while, the Minister of Health was my old office mate when I was doing my graduate training. That happens every once in a while, but it very rarely happens. And so not only are you communicating uncertainty, you're communicating to a non-expert audience who has to translate that into the limited tools available to the government, right? And although it'd be nice to say, we just deal with the science, they deal with the policy. That's always a porous boundary. It's always a challenge to draw that line. And on top of it, they're not expert in this area. And so it's a real challenge. And it, it ends up, you know, you've seen some of the polarization around COVID. It's often seen as elites dictating the non-elites. In some ways, it has to. The third challenge in all of this is that, you know, science advice we think is important, it's actually not necessarily valued by the university. And so just a second, people would raise their hands. Who sat on a tenure or a promotion committee? Great. Who um, explicitly considered the impact of that work as opposed to the papers, the grants, and other things in making that judgment? Okay. So you see, it's, it's something we value a lot but we don't actually dive it in the right way. And the Academy actually, I think is trying to change on this. You know, there's the Hollenberg report here at U of T. Uh, in our own school, we actually have a section where we talk about impact, although it is, again, maddeningly uncertain to try to capture that and show it. But we don't necessarily value this. So you have all these experts working who then are actually doing another job as well, providing science advice. And so during the pandemic, I maintain my course load. I teach three courses. I kept my job as the dean of the school. I tried to put out, out sort of a middling amount of papers and failed miserably at that. Uh, and even got one grant application, which didn't succeed. But the university doesn't value that. I'm not the only one who dealt with that. You're going to, you know, Allison is a remarkable scholar. I expect that you probably had most nights about two or three hours of sleep uh, during the pandemic. You're going to be followed by Andrew Guzari, who spent, you know, really did uh, lack of uh, a better term god's work out making sure people got vaccinated and got tested who wouldn't have gotten it otherwise we all had to keep on with what we we're doing right and there's an interesting article by ed yang who has been one of the most thoughtful uh commentators on the pandemic in the Atlantic, that the pandemic experts are not okay and so it's an uncertain challenging thing to communicate uh, you're communicating to people who aren't really trained in the same way 
And by the way, it's not really down. You've got to kind of do it off the edge of your And not surprisingly, we've seen a lot of kind of burnout behavior, for lack of a better word, during the pandemic by the experts. And for those of you who are on Twitter, I'm sure you've seen kind of outbursts and expressions. I'm not actually surprised about it. And it's going to be interesting to see how folks kind of come down on it. Um, I think the next thing uh, to kind of point on is that this is not an established institution. So I sort of talked about the CDC, right? That's 70 odd years, maybe more, of giving advice on infectious diseases and health problems. SAGE has been around since uh, mad cow disease, since bovine sponge form and cephalitis in the UK or even earlier. They've actually got guidance on how to do this. We really started up our public health agencies, our sort of scientific advice on this after the SARS pandemic. And on top of it, I'll get to this in a second, they're the easiest thing to cut. There's some problems with how we think about public health that further weakens the science process. But to be really, really sort of blunt about it, we don't have an institution of scientific advice. We have a remarkable, remarkable institution of science in this country. Uh, every time when I've you know, been working at innovation policy or as a governor elsewhere, we punch above our weight in the quality and you know, the volume of our scholarship, really, remarkably so. But we don't have an institution about giving that or turning that into policy advice, which is a bit of a challenge. And not surprisingly, uh, you know, I'll tell a little story. I left the university for about six years to go into government. Uh, I was about to go up for tenure, and every one of my colleagues here in Canada said, well, okay, uh, have you seen a neurologist? You should get your head checked out. Why are you doing this? My mentor in the state said, this is what you should have done a long time ago, because it'll round out your experiences. All of my colleagues in the UK had already spent time in science. And so we don't have that sort of institution. This is part of the job of what we do, nor do we have the institutions in kind of the bricks and mortar sense. So these are the places that do this. And so we're just kind of getting used to having a public health agency. We're just kind of getting used to having a public health organization for the files. And so it's not an institution. It's uncertain, it's wicked or uncertain. It's, you know, um, not really valued. You're trying to communicate to people who are coping with you know, a whole bunch of different challenges. And I can talk more about that. And it's not really something that's expected, right? And if you kind of really dug underneath the work that, you know, people like Allison and I and Peter Uni and Brian Schwartz and any number of other people did on the science table, it was a complete confection. There isn't a letter that says set up a science table. We just started doing it, right? Uh, because it was necessary and there was a factor, which again creates challenges in itself because how does this fit into the apparatus of decision making? And you know, I'll, I'll kind of say it's also a real challenge for public health to maintain the resources to do this. And I want to just dig in slightly here for a second. The first thing, that, the nice thing I should say about public health is when it's working, you don't notice it, right? You turn on the tap and the water comes out and no one gets sick and that's great. Well, then we know what happens when that doesn't work. If there's not a pandemic raging, well, okay, so maybe I'll get my vaccine. I know my kids will get it at school. It's just, when it's working, it's kind of silent. You know, there's probably a good musical analogy here that I've never been able to come up with, but it's silent and it's an easy thing to kind of cut. There's not a ribbon cutting ceremony like you would have with hospital. And there's very few people standing up and saying, I really need to make sure that my public health person can get to this problem in the next week. And there's lots of people saying that about their care. And so it's really hard to resource public health sufficiently. It's also really hard to resource it at the scale necessary to deal with the pandemic. And so you know, we talked earlier about why are there higher rates? I was listening to Nelson's uh, talking the questions. Why are there higher rates in our uh, marginalized communities? Well, there's lots of argument about this, but actually it's issues of risk of infection for the most part. They have to get on the subway. They have to go to work. There's several of them in a house. They're multi-generational. It's the risk of exposure side. But that is not a problem that's solved by a really good epidemiologist. That's a problem that's solved by an economist, or it's a problem solved by a management scholar, or it's a problem solved by a sociologist or an anthropologist. And so it's not just science, like let's get some people who are infectious disease experts in the room. It's the whole gamut of what a place like the university does and maintaining that depth and that breadth is really challenging. Uh, and so there's gotta be at some point, you know, some reckoning where the universities, which is the only place that can maintain that breadth and depth, start to figure out how they play a role in this in a way that's maybe a little bit faster. Uh, 
when it does though, when it does work out well, you do get wonderful things. And so when the pandemic started, we had no lead indicators of the pandemic. We had really no effective wastewater system. We talk a lot about wastewater now. We, this was a, a really novel idea to policymakers this, that we do this. But to be fair, government invested in wastewater. We've now got a data collection system that I'd say is top five in the world and an analytic system that says among the top in the world. And then that happened in a relatively short order. And now we actually do have a lead indicator. It's very challenging. I, what I work in is always boring. Now it's also offensive at a cocktail party to talk about it. <laughs> but this is, you know, it, it's a success when it actually turns out. And you get this capacity. And now we do have the ability to try to look a little bit into the future. And you can just see here uh, the work that uh, the secretary has done in actually standing up a wastewater system. Not perfect yet, but better, much better than what we have. And it's also really hard to figure out who's on first. And again, if I was a more clever presenter, I'd be able to kind of rework the whole ad and sell a theme about uh, who's on first and so on at the Fed somewhere, in the province somewhere, in the uh, city somewhere, and experts uh, like our table somewhere. Uh, and you maybe get a little bit of humor out of all of it. But we do have very challenging overlapping mandates. <clears throat> for understandable both historical and sort of political science reasons. But this really does create a challenge. Do you listen to the chief public health officer? Do you listen to the chief medical officer of health? Do you listen to the local medical officer of health? Do you listen to experts? Because they may all be saying something slightly different, understandable reasons, and it's unclear to understand where the authority is. And it's been interesting as I, you know, as we cope through the pandemic, I've got rapidly growing children. So I found myself buying jeans for my son who's now 13 and 6'2", which is terrifying, but I bought them every three months. And I went to the same place in the day, the same place just to get a bigger size. And the way that they, each person interpreted those things and then explained to me why they were behind the screen, wearing a mask, not wearing a mask, not touching this, using, you know, a whole thing. All were attributed to different people all at different levels of authority, and it really creates a challenge in terms of context of different class. So what do we do about this? I think I'm supposed to wrap up shortly and make sure we've got time for questions, so I'll do this really quickly. Well, the short answer again is simple, but not necessarily easy. We do need capacity to do this. We have to have a way to access that capacity quickly so that when the next health emergency comes, and I hope it's a long time from now, I hope it's not a pandemic, but when that capacity is needed, it's there and can be activated really quickly. But it's more than just having a phone book. It's more than just having a structure. There's things you need to do to make sure that uh, activity works well. And the first thing is, and, and I do think this is both simple and easy, but it is critical, is to have very strong principles about the work you do. And those are independence and transparency. And even though I think we've set a high watermark uh, in our work here in Ontario around independence and transparency, we are still attacked almost every week. Uh, we publish who the names are of people. We don't allow uh, political uh, officials into the meetings. Uh, we publish every report that we complete. Sometimes we don't complete a report because we're not sure that even we can get to sort of a, a useful thing. Um, we uh, don't pay people. Which is amazing when you think that you know these are all people who are giving up you know, a lot of them are giving up clinical time or they're doing extra stuff um and we publish our conflicts of interest in fact when we don't keep those up to date uh we get in trouble but that's a high water mark but you got to have those things ingrained and rigorous and as you know we're thinking about how we transition and move the science table along this is going to be the two dominant topics of conversation in the science so the independence and transparency um, the second is an important function. And I think there's two sides to this. You need clarity on what you're supposed to be doing. And the fundamental to, uh, issue here is to provide what's called a serviceable proof. Not to do research, but to provide a truth that has, or evidence that has consensus around it that can provide a platform for action or at least input to action. Uh, you know, it's the same here. I also showed the recovery trial. I really wish in Canada we could have studied one up as quickly and as broadly and as effectively. Uh, and, you know, actually, because the scientists and the clinicians that uh, Alison mentioned, we did, we did as well as we could have. But it's not research, it's actually that creation of the proof and sort of coming through that consensus around it. But the other side of an important function is that this needs to be valued. 
uh, you know, we're struggling with this in our own school right now. How do you make sure when you come up with both something that is you know, a matter of discovery, but also something that has impact, that that gets valued in all these discussions? And that's, that is a challenging, challenging thing to do, but it has to be valued. Uh, there needs to be a clear scope for advice and advisees. So who are you giving advice to? Is it public? Is it to decision makers? Uh, who are you actually sort of scoping this around? Because if you're not, the communication becomes even more challenging. And you know, as I said, you know, this uh, scope for advice, this sort of serviceable truth, right? That's what you're looking for. You've got to have strong leadership and communication capability. And that's very different from having the smartest person in the room. Um, often, I think we tend to sort of, because of the way that we've all been trained, the way that we've all sort of kind of grown up in our careers, uh, we look for the person who's got the answer. That's not necessarily the person who's going to engender consensus. Uh, we often look for the person who's done the most thoughtful work. That's not the person who can necessarily bring a group together because uh, you do want those multiple points of view. It's not necessarily the person who can communicate. Uh, you know, we've done something interesting in the last little while that we've actually built a journalism program at the School of Public Health. Uh, and that's a bit of an odd fit. I still struggle with it at times. But the whole point of it, it's going to make sure that our, the people we train, have the opportunity to learn how to communicate as effectively as possible. Um, and you, a few things would be nice to have. It'd be nice to know who's on first. Uh, you know, there were more than 18 federal advisory groups during the pandemic, some of which uh, we know about and did phenomenal work, some of which we just don't know about. Uh, there were multiple groups here in Ontario. Uh, we do need support for broad and deep scientific capacity. I talked about there being almost 100 scientists and anyone time involved in the work of the bar table. That was the breadth. Uh, we can kind of gun that system along for a little while because there's a crisis and because people have a strong response to intrinsic uh, incentives. But there needs to be some way of supporting this in a broader way over a longer time. And you know, coming back to that important function, the academy has to value this. Now, it'll still keep on going. Uh, the nice thing about being in a university is that most of the people in the university are economically irrational actors. They don't just make decisions on money. Um, but you can only really kind of prey upon that or build upon that for a while. You need to actually have a way of sort of value for the academy, if it's promotion, tenure, or credit, or any number of things that actually sort of says that's a viable thing. And I think I have 25 minutes, and hopefully I'm reasonably on time with that. And, you know, I have some questions. Thanks for letting me come try to bring together. Great to 